Welcome to worship, everyone. Let's uh, stand together. We're going to join in song, and we all will have some more folks coming over from dinner. Let's join in song. Let's, uh, we're going to sing, sing, sing for the first song and also sing Glory to God Forever. Let's join in song together. Grateful that you hear us when we shout your 
Angels and saints cry out. We join them as we sing glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. you gave me breath so I could praise your great and matchless name all my days all my days so let my whole life be a blazing offering a life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King glory to God glory to God glory to God for And the little child shall lead them. <laughs> so, welcome to Trinity tonight. This is our second in our midweek Lenten services as we make our journey to Calvary this, uh, this Lenten season. Uh, just a couple quick announcements before we share the piece. First off, uh, you'll notice our prayer cross at communion time. There'll be someone here that if you wish to have prayer, you can avail yourself of that. If you wish to leave a written prayer, out uh, near the cross that's in the, uh, uh, sanctu uh, the uh, Narthex, please do so. The only other thing I will mention is that we have our sign-up sheet for the Lenten meals as far as uh, donations for dessert and salad over uh, to your left as you exit the Narthex doors. Uh, if you can help us out with that, or you can be of, you know, be of service on one of those uh, evenings or in the morning, be able to, to help out with the uh, preparation and service of food. We'd appreciate any help you can offer there. So with that, the only thing I want to say now is the peace of the Lord be with you always. And let's share that peace with one another.
All right. We'd invite you, uh, after you're finished sharing the piece, back to your seats, and we're going to continue. You can go ahead and take a seat. We'd like to share a song with you this evening, our featured song. It's called You Said by a, a duo called Shane and Shane. Um, one of my favorite songs um, really talks about um, how when we ask, God always responds to us, um, whatever we need. So this is called You Said. Asking you will receive whatever you need. You said, pray and I'll hear from heaven. And I'll heal your land. I'll heal your land. I'll heal your land. Your glory will fill the earth like water the sea. And you said, lift up your eyes, the harvest is here, the kingdom is near. You said, ask and I'll give the nations to you, O oh Lord. That's the cry of my heart. Distant shores and the islands will see your light as it rises on us. You said, and you will receive whatever you need. And you said, pray and I'll hear from heaven. And I'll heal your land. I'll heal your land. I'll heal your land. Your glory will fill the earth like water the sea. And you said, lift up your eyes, the harvest is here, the kingdom is near. You said, ask and I'll give the nations to you, O oh Lord. That's the cry of my heart. Distant shores and the islands will see your light as it rises on us. Ask and I'll give the nations to you, O oh Lord. That's the cry of my heart. Distant shores and the Islands will see your light as it rises on us. Ask and I'll give the nations to you, O oh Lord. That's the cry of my heart. Distant shores and the islands will see your light as it rises on us. At this time, we invite our children, age three to grade two, to depart for their uh, program. And invite you to stand. 
Our scripture is from Romans, the 10th chapter. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of the Lord. Good evening. Would you pray with me? Gracious Lord, now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each and every heart be acceptable and pleasing to you. Speak to us through your word, and may we hear what you have to say. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So if you were with us this past weekend, then the scripture that we just read may sound familiar to you. It was also the first reading from the, uh, the scripture readings of this weekend. And if you were with us, you may also recall Pastor Jay sharing that during this Lenten journey, we won't be going through a sermon series per se, but rather we'll be lifting up different voices of faith uh, with an intentional focus of getting back to the basics. So tonight, we're going to be looking at one of the most basic of questions when it comes to Christianity, and that is this, how do I know that I'm saved? Am I truly saved? See, it's a question that plagues so many professing believers, and it actually, a lot of the time, I think, stems not necessarily from a lack of faith, but from a lack of assurance. Hello? <laughs> uh, so here, let me, let me ask you if this scenario sounds familiar to you. You go to a conference, maybe as a teenager, as part of a youth gathering, or you go to a Christian concert, or maybe to a revival service, and the pastor or the speaker stands up, and uh, toward the end of their message, the lights get dimmed real low and the music starts playing in the background. They begin making this impassioned plea that sounds something like this. If you were to die today, do you know where you'd be spending eternity? If you knew that 10 minutes from now, you'll be standing before the throne of God and your entire life will be judged according to his perfect standard, how would you measure up? And then they say something similar to this. I want everybody in the room to close their eyes with nobody looking around and by a show of hands, if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you desire to do so today, would you please raise your hand? Or maybe they're a little bit more bold, and, <laughs> and so they ask you to come forward and to kneel at the altar or to stand in front of the stage so that someone can come and to pray with you. And then they ask you to repeat a prayer that goes something like this. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe that you died on the cross and rose again to forgive me of my sins. Please come into my life and be my savior. Amen. And then they declare that you are now saved and then you leave on this emotional high with this new lease on life. But then what happens? You go back to your life and a week or two goes by and you're not feeling that same rush like you did that night. So you start to question, you know, was that real? Am I still saved? You know, maybe that week started off with good intentions. You had really good intentions and then as the week went on, you messed up. You fell back into an old sin and now you're left wondering, will God still forgive me? Have I lost my salvation? Was I ever really saved to begin with? And so a lot of Christians spend the majority of their Christian life seeking after this high rather than seeking after God. And this is all too common, especially in evangelical circles. In my experience with youth groups, it was always disheartening to see the same kids get saved year after year. Because what that said to me was that they had no assurance. They had to keep coming back each retreat or each conference or each mission trip to get that same release of endorphins and their faith was based more on their feelings than it was on the word of God. And by the way, this is not unique to teenagers. Christians of every age do the same thing. We base our assurance on how we're feeling with God on a particular day. Let me ask you this. Do you think that Noah was safe on the ark? I see a lot of blank, blank faces. Do you think Noah was safe on the ark? Yeah, right? Scripture tells us that. It says that the, mountain, uh, that the ark came to rest safely on the top of Mount Ararat. 
So we know that he was safe, but let me ask you this. Do you think he always felt safe? You know, when the winds picked up, when the waters rise, when there was no land in sight, maybe, maybe not. I know I probably wouldn't always feel safe under those circumstances. So what made Noah safe? Was it his feelings or was it the ark, the solid beams that were underneath his feet that he could stand upon? See, salvation is the same way. How you or I feel about our salvation on a given day does not in the slightest bit change the firm foundation of Jesus Christ, who is the solid rock upon whom our hope rests. Now, many of you have known me for a number of years, and I've shared bits and pieces of my own testimony here and there. But since during this time, we're taking an intentional look at the voices of faith in this hashtag series, not series, um, I thought this would be a good time to share my story. See, in some ways I resonate with Pastor Jay because as he's shared before, I don't really have this definitive conversion moment that I can point to and say, you know, this is where my journey of faith really began. Rather, my journey has been marked with stages of progression, I'll call them, where I've seen God bring about change in my life. See, I grew up in the church. My parents were and still are active members of the Church of the Nazarene in their congregation in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And it's there that I was baptized at the age of seven. So I guess if you want to make a hard argument for where my faith journey began, I guess you could say that was it. But as I continued to grow, I became very active in our congregation's youth ministry. I attended weekly youth gatherings, and I went on just about every trip that was offered. Now, here's where I have a confession to make. See, those teenagers that I saw responding to altar call after altar call, I was one of them. I may not have raised my hand or gone forward each and every time, but in my heart, I was yearning for the assurance of my salvation. I can't tell you how many sinners' prayers I've prayed. A moment that stands out to me was on a youth retreat my uh, freshman year of high school. I can't tell you the theme of the weekend or what the speaker said, but I clearly felt the urging of the Holy Spirit to recommit my life to Christ. Not that I hadn't been saved up until that point, but it was a moment of renewal in my relationship with God. The following year, I went back, and that time I received a different urging. It was a call to go into ministry. Now, it started as an inner prompting that was confirmed by a friend who didn't even know that I'd been considering it. He had just made an offhand comment that I'd make a good youth pastor, which made me pause and start to consider it a little bit more seriously. And the more I prayed on it and sought discernment from my parents and elders in the church, the more confirmation I received. So after high school, that led me to pursue an undergrad degree in youth ministry and biblical studies from Eastern University, which is located not too far from Philadelphia. And it was there that I ended up meeting my lovely wife, Katie. And uh, after graduation from Eastern, we decided to get hitched and uh, moved down to Maryland, where she was born and raised, where she grew up. And I worked for about a year in office furnishing until I came across a posting in 2012 for a youth director position in a little place called Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church in Joppa, Maryland. So I applied, I interviewed, and for some reason, y'all saw something in this uh, kid, really, who was fresh out of college, fresh into marriage, and about to be fresh into parenthood. But even since we joined the Trinity family, God has been at work in our lives and in this congregation. Back in 2015, I was approached by Pastor Paul about this position of lay minister, which has since morphed into pastoral assistant. And I was also offered some assistance in going to seminary. It was another time of prayer and intentional discernment, but we were led to accept it at that time. And since then, I've learned a lot. I've grown a lot in ministry and even in my faith. And that leads us to the past year or so. As I'm sure all of you know, there's been a lot of transition going on in this congregation. But at the same time, I've also kind of been on a private journey of discernment of sorts. See, how many of you know that discernment is a difficult spiritual discipline? It is. It's difficult because it takes directed prayer and intentional listening to discern the next door that God is leading you to walk through. It's perhaps even more difficult when the answer you receive is not to walk through it. See, I could have all the doors of all creation open to me, but if God has not told me to move, then I have to obey him. And so for the time being, I'd like to share with you all um, that I've decided to place a hold on the ordination track that I've been pursuing. 
Now, there's a lot more detail into this discernment that's gone you know, over the past year, year and a half or so. I'd love to talk with anybody who wants to discuss it, but time doesn't really permit me to, to share that right now. But suffice it to say, that means that I intend to finish out this class that I'm currently in and then apply to be what's called a certified lay minister through the NALC. Now, this hopefully will not change my responsibilities here, so I'll still be doing everything that I've been doing, but it may open up opportunities uh, to serve the NALC at large and some other congregations in our area at the same time. So the long and short of it is that I intend to stay for as long as Trinity will have me uh, or until God says otherwise. But even though walking through times of discernment can be challenging, there are also periods of refinement. The process of being refined in your faith is a lifelong process. And I'd be lying to you if I said that I was anywhere near the level of refinement that I want to be at. See, case in point, sometimes, you know, I'll find myself questioning whether I'm doing enough as a Christian. Anybody else in that boat? Anybody feel that same way? I'm not doing enough. I'm not reading my Bible enough. I'm not evangelizing enough, right? We all do that. You know, for example, I'll look at Scripture and I'll ask myself things like, am I really keeping the Sabbath? Should I observe it on a Saturday? What about the Old Testament festival? Should I be practicing those? I just had a great conversation over the weekend with some friends about this very topic. But you know, there was a group of people that Paul railed against for trying to impose Jewish customs on Gentile believers, for trying to do enough. This group of people were called the Judaizers, Jewish believers who taught that in order for Gentiles to be saved, they must first conform to the Mosaic law. And they especially pushed circumcision as a requirement for salvation. But Paul adamantly argues against this in a number of places in the New Testament, such as Romans 2.29, where he says, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. Or take Galatians 2.16, where Paul says, a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Or even verses such as the ones that we just read out of Romans chapter 10. They say this, For there is no difference between Jew or Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What Paul's saying here is that there's no difference between Jew and Gentile because all are sinners. But at the same time, all can be saved through faith. That's difficult for us to accept because as humans, our default position is to confer merit based on our deeds, right? That's how our society functions. You have value only if you can produce something. So we spend thousands of dollars earning these degrees and these skills that will make us more marketable to employers. And we present ourselves a certain way on social media so that we can connect with professionals on LinkedIn and maybe land ourselves a good paying job. And we work tirelessly to climb this corporate ladder and attempt to prove ourselves to others all in the name of success, right? That's the world system. We were born into that. And so that's our default mode. But those who are in Christ are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says. So if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you have been born again and you no longer have to conform to the pattern of this world. The pattern of this world is to try to earn your salvation. Works righteousness. Every other world religion relies on some kind of works-based system of righteousness. But what did we read in our passage from Romans 10? Let's look again at verses 9 through 11. He says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. See, the motto of every true Christian should be this, Jesus is Lord. It's that simple. Faith requires not only an inward belief, but an outward witness to that belief. So Paul says that it is with your mouth you confess and are saved. It's not simply enough to believe, even the demons do that. But in our confession that Jesus is Lord, it's a declaration to forsake all others. It is a proclamation that he has authority over your life. 
It is an understanding that he is Lord of your past to forgive you your sins. He is Lord of your present to guide and comfort you. And he is Lord of your future, both in this life and for all eternity. See, reciting some prayer and accepting Jesus into your heart is not biblical. And neither is the notion that salvation has to be accompanied by this grand experience. What is biblical is this, repent. That is to turn away from your old way of thinking. Believe that Jesus is Lord and confess, witness to that change of heart. That's it. Now there will be fruits that will be evidence in your life if you have truly done these things. But as for salvation, that's all that's required. The problem is that we can so easily revert back to our default way of thinking. Because after all, forgiveness and eternal life are such amazing gifts that there must be something that we can do to pay for them. But there's not. That's what scripture says. And religion really hasn't helped us much in this area. See, in our desperation to build credit with God, we've reached and clung to whatever traditions are comfortable to us. So not unlike the Judaizers, many well-intentioned believers have subtly infused the gospel with works. At the Council of Trent in 1563, the Catholic Church explicitly denied the doctrine of salvation by faith alone. And for that reason, chiefly, the Protestant Reformation grew in opposition to that. But some, even in Protestant churches today, will skirt that line with things like how we treat baptism. Is it necessary for salvation? No. Not according to scripture. We do uphold it because Jesus commands it in the Great Commission, but it's not a requirement to be saved. The prime example for this is the thief on the cross. He wasn't baptized. But what did Jesus tell him? Truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. So whether it's circumcision or Sabbath keeping or even baptism, we cannot earn God's grace. That's the point. And the sad truth is that there are millions of people today who think that they're saved because of something that they've done. They've been baptized. They've recited a prayer. They've generally been a good person. But none of those will save you. These are the people Jesus refers to in Matthew chapter 7 who will say, Lord, Lord, and he will respond to them. Depart from me. I never knew you. Proverbs 4.12 says, There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Notice that it says that there is a way that seems right. A way, not the way. That's the big deception that so many people have been and will continue to fall for. People are searching for a way and not the way. Because broad is the road that leads to destruction and narrow is the road that leads to life. And by the way, you want to know just how narrow that road is? It's about the width of one man. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Acts 4.12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. So we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone and nothing else. But until we settle this question of assurance in our standing with God, we will be robbed of the power to walk in victory like he wants us to. And we will never have peace and assurance. Think of the last time that you were at an airport terminal. Anybody fly recently? Okay, a number of us. Well, next time you go and you're on a flight and you're in an airport terminal, <clears throat> excuse me, you're at an airport terminal, pay close attention to the passengers who have a confirmed ticket versus those who are on standby. The passengers who have a confirmed ticket act a lot differently than those who are standby. They walk around, they talk on their phone, they go get food, they even sleep. They have assurance that they're gonna be on that next flight. But those who are on standby, what do they do? They have no rest. They pace back and forth. They're continually checking at the, the counter to see if they have a ticket available. They don't have that assurance. The same is true with us. Uh, I'm going to ask for a volunteer. Don't be shy. One per, all the way. Uh, Bill, I'm going to take you. All right, uh, if you'd be so kind to come on up here. And you have something of value on your person right now. <laughs> I thought you trusted me. <laughs> I just want to borrow it. All right, your phone. All right, so this is a safe box. We all know how these work, right? Do I know how this works? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> Yeah, 
There we go. Yeah, that, that's, not the, <laughs> that's not the point of it. You can do that if you want. All right, so this safe box represents our, our salvation, the assurance of it. This, your treasure that you put in here, that is our prized possession. I'm going to give you the key to this safe box, all right? What I want you to do is, once I close it, <laughs> and it locks. It's worked a lot better at the first service. All right. But what I want you to try to do is to open that, not with the key, but open it with your hands. See if you can open it by yourself. Okay, cheer them on. <laughs> no. All right, right. Can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. Now try using the key. <laughs> I promise it's the right key. See, it's not just me. <laughs> you got to push down. I did. There we go. There we go. Oh, you can take your phone back. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Bill. All right. So this box represents the assurance of our salvation, right? That prized possession that we put in there is our salvation. That is the pearl beyond price, right, that Jesus talks about. Our salvation is this pearl beyond price. It's the greatest thing that we could ever have. But so often what we try to do is we try to take hold of that by our own means. We try to open that box by our own strength. When God has already given us the key to that assurance, the key is found in his word. The word of God is all the assurance that we need. Take a look with me at 1 John chapter 5. See, the entire book of 1 John, this entire letter, he dedicates to giving his readers assurance. Verses 4 and 5 say this. He says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And then a few verses later in verse 13, he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know, you may know that you have eternal life. That's your assurance right there. Our assurance does not rest in our works. It does not rest in doing enough. It rests on thus saith the Lord. We take hold of it through faith. So what I want to ask you to do this evening in closing is if you believe in Jesus Christ and confess him as Lord, then you can be sure that you have eternal life. So if you believe, I'm going to ask you in a second that question. And I want you to respond with the motto, Jesus is Lord. But don't just say it. Don't just say it to say it. Don't say it because I asked you to. Say it only if it is true in your heart. If you believe that it is true in your heart. So do you believe Jesus is Lord? And let's begin acting like it. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this pearl of beyond price of salvation that he has given to us as a free gift that none can earn by works. We cannot take hold of it. We cannot be good enough. We cannot do good enough. There is no one who is good. No, not one. So Father, remind us of that. But also remind us of the gospel. Remind us of the good news that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. That if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that you raised him from the dead, then we will be saved. So Father, I pray that you would strengthen our faith. Give us that assurance to walk boldly in faith as we go forth from this place to proclaim Jesus is Lord, not only by our lips, but also by our hands and our feet and all that we do that others may be drawn to that and may be able to proclaim Jesus is Lord. And it is in his name that we ask these things. Amen. Let's stand together.
and every enemy will flee as we declare your victory this we know this we know i will call upon the lord for he alone is strong enough to save rise your shackles are no more for jesus christ has broken every chain i will call I will call upon the Lord, for He alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. Let's sing this out together. Jesus' name. Jesus' name will break every stronghold. Freedom is ours when we call his name. Jesus' name above every other. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Jesus' name will break every stronghold. Freedom is ours when we call His name. Jesus' name above every other. All hail the power of Jesus' name. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Sing this out. I will call. I will call upon the Lord, for He alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. I call upon the Lord, for He alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he gave his own precious, innocent, sinless life so that we can be forgiven. We can be free from the penalty of sin. We can be assured of eternal life. He taught us to ask, to seek, and to knock. So we pray. We pray that you would stir within us the faith to trust in him, the courage to live out our faith and thought, word, and deed. This world in which we live surrounds us with the presence of disbelief, pride, and, and selfish living. Grant that your Holy Spirit would empower and, and compel each one of us to stand up and to speak up for Jesus. We pray for all who, who grieve over those who perished in the recent airplane crash. We pray that you would comfort, console the, these families as well as the families of, of the victims of the tragic accident that occurred in Bel Air just two days ago. We pray for your healing for those injured, that you would keep all of us mindful of the great responsibility we have in, in operating our vehicles. 
We pray, Lord, for not only our safety, but the safety and the protection for our servicemen and women, our police officers, all of our first responders. And we pray for our fellow persons here and among us. Tonight, Lord, we seek your consolation for Adrian Cox and his family upon the passing of, of his father, Herbert. You blessed Herbert with 101 years of life on this earth. Comfort Adrian and his family with the assurance of Herbert's eternal life in heaven. And now we lift up for healing all of the names that we have on our, our prayer list, the, the list here at church. Uh, we pray for those by name, among them Curtis Pendleton and Roy and Linda Krebs, that you would continue to be with Kathleen Causey and Dwayne Parker, Mark Franker and Del Birch, Ron Gorobin, Bunky Morkowski, Norm and Sandy Bartlett, and Dawn Peary, Richard Carter, Pastor Bill Wallace, John Adams and Peter Coughlin, Melanie Rode, Reed Tittle, Ashur Wilson, Mikel Azim, Bill Keene, Karen Arnold, Bill Lashley, and all of those that we name either silently in our hearts or out loud before your altar at this time. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please.
my faith will stand. And I will call upon your name. And keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. I am yours, and you are mine. Your grace abounds in deepest waters, your sovereign hand will be my guide where feet may fail and fear surrounds me you never fail and you won't start now and I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the way when oceans rise, my soul rests in your embrace. I am yours, and you are mine. Oh. trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. And take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. And take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. And I will call upon your name And keep my eyes above the wave My soul will rest in your embrace I am yours And you are mine The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen.
I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. I'm pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse, for his promise will endure, that his joy is going to be my strength. Though the sorrow may last for the night, his joy comes in the morning. I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain I'm laying them down For the joy of the Lord Come on, we say yes We say yes, Lord Yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord Yes, Lord, yes, Lord Yes, yes, Lord Yes, Lord, yes, Lord Yes, yes, Lord Amen We say yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. <laughs> Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks for watching. Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church can be found at 1100 Philadelphia Road in Joppa, Maryland, and at trinityjoppa.org. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat. Be sure to check out the Facebook page for our Trinity Joppa YouTube channel, and please consider supporting our Patreon at patreon.com slash trinityjoppa. God bless.